you know, this has been a really weird year, as you all know. Um, you know, book festivals and um, book trade shows and library conferences and everything um, were canceled in the past year. So we've had to do all these things virtually. Um, we've had to look for new ways to try and get books out to people, um, to let people know about um, new books that the library has, because we're continuing to buy and process books. It's just really hard to get them to people. Um, so as Aaron mentioned, we do have the YouTube videos. We have a YouTube um, channel. So you can get to that either by going to the library's website and just scrolling down and clicking on the YouTube link, or you can go directly to YouTube and just do a search for Save Stuff Public Library. Every two weeks, we're um, doing videos of new books, new fiction, and new nonfiction. And we're interspersing new DVDs, new large print. Um, we're doing some genre type things. So um, we're doing videos like, if you like Louise Penny, you might like this other author, that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of stuff out there. It's these are not videos with any kind of sound. It's just basically a PowerPoint. We spend so many seconds on each title and you just kind of watch it and take notes and you can go back and watch it again. Okay, there was um, kind of one upside, I guess, to um, things being closed. And that is, you know, each year we solicit recommendations from our patrons and our staff and our, and our um, volunteers and everybody about the best books. So this year, um, Aaron put a survey on the website. Um, and so we got more responses this year to that question as to what were your best books of 2020 than we've ever had in the past. So that's kind of nice. So even when we go back to you know, normal, whatever that is, um, I think we'll continue to go ahead and have a survey online because that's a really good way to, to get people's ideas. OK. so. Um, in order to come up with this list, of course, we look at um, people's suggestions, we look at critics list, we look at the end of the year um, best books lists that always come out, we look at award winners for the year. Um, I then try to come up with a list of books that cover a wide variety of genres. So, you know, it really ranges from um, literary fiction to romance to biography and science to um, um, you name it, fantasy, science fiction, try to come up with some representative titles of all of those. Not every book that people recommend are listed or are discussed in this program. Um, I do limit those to books that were published in 2020 or at the very end of 2019. Um, and um, while the discussed books are in the, the, the main handout, which you get every year when you come to the program, um, I have everything that people have recommended in, in a bigger handout. So let me just mention the handouts. The one you can find online or in the lobby is the discussion list that I give out every year at this program where you can go down the list and see what I'm talking about. This year we tried something a little bit different. We do have a column for whether or not the book is available in audio CD here at the library, whether it's downloadable, um, whether it's large print and that kind of stuff. You know, it, it took some time to do that, so I'm not sure we're gonna do that every year, but we'll try. So we do have that. And then every year I also have kind of a little booklet list, and this includes everything that everybody's recommended. Because there's a lot of us who, you know, I'm still catching up on last year's best books, and so I'm not gonna discuss them again this year, but, you know, they might be listed in here because I really, I really enjoyed the book. And because there was so much feedback this year, um, I ran out of room. So usually I have a little section called Authors to Know. So I now have an insert, a double-sided insert of some selected authors to know. Um, so these two things are not on the website. So if you want these two, you have to come in during our lobby hours to pick them up. We just have the list of what I'm going to be talking about today. Okay. So I can um, only discuss so many books, so I've had to make some choices as to what to talk about. I try to stay clear of most of the really popular authors like Louise Penny or James Patterson, just because you know people know about those. And this gives a chance for kind of lesser known authors to be discussed. Um, I discuss only books that we have available in print here at the library in addition to whatever format might be available. Um, 
I try to give a brief description of the book. I might quote a patron or a coworker when they've said something about the book. Um, I also might read something from one of the review journals like Library Journal, Publishers Weekly, Kirkus, um, Library Reads, which is a really good site. Um, and finally, just so that I say this every single year, I have not read all of these books, okay? Because we have you know, probably 55 to 60 books that I talk about. And um, some of these books I'm still on hold for. So that's why I haven't even gotten a chance to read them. If the book sounds at least remotely interesting to you, um, I would suggest trying it. Because if I haven't read the book, I don't think I always do justice to the book. And, um, and yet if I've read a book and I really, really loved it, I can usually talk a lot you know, more animatedly about it. Um, so if it sounds at all interesting to you, I would recommend highly that you still check out the book. Okay, and I think with that, I'm going to try and share my screen. <laughs> go ahead. There you go. Okay, so before I get to all the best books, I will tell you um, probably the biggest, most popular book that people requested um, this year was Michael Connelly's The Law of Innocence. Um, another really close runner-up was um, David Baldacci's latest book, which I can't remember the title of. But um, these were huge, popular books. This is the first one. You know, uh, Michael Connelly has two main series that he does, Harry Bosch and Nicky Haller. And Harry Bosch is the policeman, and Nicky Haller is the, um, the lawyer. And he hasn't done the lawyer one for since 2013. And those are actually the ones that I like the best. Um, so this book came out this fall. It's been extremely popular. We've got like 20 holds on it. Um, and um, I'm still on hold for it, so I haven't read it yet either. But um, that's the most um, requested book, I think, this year at the library. So, okay, Aaron, next. And next. Okay, so the first book that I'm going to mention is called A Paragon by Colin McCann. And unfortunately, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm trying to read my notes. So this, is, this will be a little weird. You don't have to look at my face if you don't want to. You can always scroll through the, through the other, other people on the screen. So McCann is an Irish writer living and working in New York. Um, previous books of his include Song Dogs, Song Dogs and Let the Great World Spin. A patron wrote about this book. This novel is about two fathers, one Israeli and one Palestinian, who have both lost their daughters to the violence in the Middle East. The unusual friendship of the two is created from their struggle to make meaning out of their tragedy or to change their experience with a hope for peace. I was struck by the violence as well as the grief in this book. The outstanding writing pushed me through such a hard read to an appreciation for the writer's work on war and peace and how personal action can heal unbelievable loss. Next. Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse. This is a fantasy. Um, Rowan Horse is um, kind of a new American fantasy writer. She's Native American, and so a lot of her fantasy comes from those traditions. This first in a trilogy is inspired by the civilizations of the pre-Columbian Americas and follows the unbalancing of the holy city of Tova amid a fateful solstice eclipse. The winter solstice is usually a time for celebration and renewal, but this year it coincides with a solar eclipse a rare celestial event prescribed by the sun priest of an unbalancing of the world. Crafted with unforgettable characters, Rebecca Roanhaus has created an epic adventure exploring the decadence of power amidst the weight of history and the struggle of individuals swimming against the confines of society and their broken paths in the most original series of the view of the decade. Um, it, is, it very much makes you think of the Mayans or the Aztecs in terms of, of the society that she talks about in this book. Um, some other fantasy read-alikes that I think are very similar to Rebecca Roanhart's are N.K. Jemison, you may have read some of her, and Andrea Stewart, who's another kind of newish author out there. Okay, next. Um, some of you may have read this very popular book this year, Literary Fiction is Sumant Kid's Forte. This is the Book of Longings. Raised in a wealthy family in Sephora, with ties to the ruler of Galilee, Anna is rebellious and ambitious, a relentless seeker with a brilliant, curious mind and a daring spirit. Defying the expectations placed on women, 
She engages in furtive scholarly pursuits and writes secret narratives about neglected and silenced women. When she meets the 18-year-old Jesus, each is drawn to and enriched by the other's spiritual and philosophical ideas. He, a flood, he becomes a floodgate for her intellect, but also the awakener of her heart. One of our patrons said, it truly is a woman's book centered on the story of a woman finding her voice. Great research on the time period and women's roles, I couldn't put it down and read it in two days. And I would add, it reminded me somewhat of The Secret Chord by Geraldine Brooks, which was a best book a couple years ago, um, or The Red Tent by Anita Diamond. Okay, next. The Book of Two Ways. You know, Jody P. Cole, I think, I think you say P. Cole, is it Pico or Pico? I don't know. Anyway, um, she's published something like 26 novels. Um, in this book, everything changes in a single moment for Dawn Adelstein. She's on a plane when the flight attendant makes an announcement, prepare for a crash landing. She braces herself as thoughts flash through her mind. The shocking thing is, the thoughts are not of her husband, but a man she last saw 15 years ago. Um, a read alike with this might be Sue Miller's Monogamy, which came out a year or two ago. Um, or author read alikes might be Elizabeth Berg or Eleanor Whitman. Next. This is the only young adult title in the group. Um, this was a really interesting book. It's written technically in verse, but it's not um, like rhyming verse or anything. It's more like they just split up the sentences into lines on the page. It reads very easily. Camino Rios lives for the summers when her father visits her in the Dominican Republic. But this time, on the day when his plane is supposed to land, Camino arrives at the airport to see crowds of crying people. In New York City, Yajera Rios is called to the principal's office, where her mother is waiting to tell her that her father, her hero, has died in a plane crash. Separated by distance and happy secrets, the two girls are forced to face a new reality in which their father is dead and their lives are forever altered. And then, when it seems like they've lost everything of their father, they learn of each other. Next. Mm. Jess Walter is a, um, writes literary fiction. He's um, based up in Spokane, Washington. Um, this book made probably most best book lists of the year. So if you like literary fiction, um, you might like The Cold Americans. This is an intimate story of brotherhood, love, sacrifice, and betrayal set against the panoramic backdrop of an earlier 20th century America that eerily echoes our own time. The Cold Millions offers a stunning, kaleidoscopic portrait of a nation grappling with the chasm between rich and poor, between harsh realities and simple dreams, featuring an unforgettable cast of cops and tramps, suffragists and socialists, madams and murderers. Next. This is a kind of fantasy novel. Um, a patron wrote, another fantasy, and who doesn't need that this year? That is entertaining and yet believable. This is the first in a new series. Library Reads reports, Scholomance is an elite school of magic where only the strongest survive, literally. Deadly beasts hide around every corner and the spells learned in class can save your life. Adventure, world building, friendships formed in adversity, and a murderous school, irresistible. Um, author Rita likes, if you've ever read The Magicians by Lev Grossman, which was a, is, is or was a TV show, um, and maybe Patrick Rothfuss's King um, Killers Chronicles, you might enjoy um, Naomi Novik and this new book in her new series. Next. After an outbreak of ghastly events aboard the Sardam, a merchant vessel returning from the East Indies, Indies to Amsterdam in 1634, fear spreads that an evil spirit is responsible. Before the ship's departure, a leper issued a stark warning about the merciless ruin that awaited it and then burst into flames. Only prisoner Sammy Pitts, an alleged British spy with uncanny powers of deduction, took the threat seriously. Soon enough at sea, on a vessel populated by murderers, cut purses, and malcontents, Throats are slit, bodies are stashed, and dark secrets are exposed. Ultimately, a monster storm upends the Sardom and destroys two other ships in the fleet. Kirkus writes, Turton has a colorful tale to tell and does so in a highly entertaining fashion. 
a devilish sea saga that never runs out of cutthroat conspiracies. Next. Okay. Here is an example of international fiction. In her 12th year, Kirabo, a young Ugandan girl, confronts a piercing question that has haunted her childhood. Who is my mother? Kirabo has been raised by women in the small village of Nateta, her grandmother, her best friend, and her many aunts. But the absence of her mother follows her like a shadow. Complicating these feelings of abandonment, as Kirabo comes of age, she feels the emergence of a mysterious second self, a headstrong and confusing force inside her at odds with her sweet and obedient nature. Kirkus writes, as a whole, the novel is a vivid, rambling delight. Mukambi's prose can be musical and rhythmic or calmly informative, as her narrative requires. In its depiction of both singular characters and a village community, this book is a jewel. Next. A staff member wrote, this is Beaker's debut novel. It's a story about a paternalistic cult and the relationship between an alcoholic mother and her 14-year-old daughter, Lacey May, who have been saved by the cult leader. The book is as gritty and coarse as the drought-stricken Central California landscape in which it is set, and as uncomfortable to read at times as the unbearable valley heat. The writing is superb, both beautiful and harsh, disquieting and uncomfortable. The story is Lacey May's, how she tolerates, believes, perseveres, and finally doubts and questions. She is a character to root for until the very last word of the novel and to cheer on even after reading the last page. Caution, this is not for the reader sensitive to graphic sexual exploration and exploitation. Yes. Guest list. This was the Good Cheese, Good Goodreads Choice Award winner for fiction for uh, 2020. Um, this is kind of similar in theme to One by One by Ruth Ware, which I'm going to be discussing a little bit later. Um, it has to do with people in a remote locale and somebody dies or goes missing. On an island off the coast of Ireland, guests gather to celebrate two people joining their lives together as one. The groom, handsome and charming, a rising television star. The bride, smart and ambitious, a magazine publisher. It's a wedding for a magazine or for a celebrity. The designer dress, the remote, remote location, the luxury party favors, the boutique whiskey, the cell phone service may be spotty and the waves may be rough, but every detail has been expertly planned and will be expertly executed. And then someone turns up dead. Who didn't wish the happy couple well? And perhaps more important, why? And you don't know until you get almost the very end of the book. So it's a great, great story. Okay, next. The author forges a new narrative voice to capture a country in which debt has ruined countless lives and our ideals have been sacrificed to the gods of finance, where a TV personality is president and immigrants live in fear, and where the nation's unhealed wounds of 9 11 wreak havoc around the world. Akhtar attempts to make sense of it all through the lens of a story about one family, from a heartland town in America to palatial suites in Central Europe to guerrilla lookouts in the mountains of Afghanistan, and spares no one, least of all himself, in the process. Next. This is the only children's book. This is a picture book, not a chapter book. Um, when a boy who stutters feels isolated, alone, and incapable of communicating in the way he'd like, he takes a kindly father on a walk by the river to help him find his voice. Poet Jordan Scott writes movingly in this powerful and ultimately uplifting book based on his own experience and masterfully illustrated by Greenaway medalist Sidney Smith, a book for any child who feels lost, lonely, or unable to fit in. Um, I heard a talk that this author gave this fall and he explained the title. And the author, Jordan Scott, stutters, and he stutters still very much as an adult. And he talked about how his father took him on a walk in the woods, and they got to this river, and they listened to the sound of the river. And his father said, you talk like the sound of the river. So it was really good. It was a really good, good story. Okay, next. Interior Chinatown by Charles Yu. This was the National Book Award winner for 2020. 
Willis Wu doesn't perceive himself as a protagonist, even in his own life. He's merely a generic Asian man. Every day, he leaves his tiny room in a Chinatown single-room occupancy hotel and enters the Golden Palace restaurant, where black and white, a procedural cop show is in perpetual production. He's a bit player here, too, but he dreams of being Kung Fu Guy, the highest aspiration he can imagine for a Chinatown dentist, or is it? After stumbling into the spotlight, Willis finds himself launched into a wider world than he's ever known, discovering not only the secret history of Chinatown, but the buried legacy of his own family and what that means for him in today's America. Yeah. And I'm still on the hold list for this one, The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V.E. Schwab. If you enjoy reading Aaron Morgenstern, who wrote The Night Circus and The Starless Sea, then you might enjoy the books by V.E. Schwab. Um, she writes under V.E. for adults, and she writes under Victoria Schwab for um, teenagers. France, 1714. In a moment of desperation, a young woman makes a Faustian bargain to live forever and is cursed to be forgotten by everyone she meets. Thus begins the extraordinary life of Annie LaRue and a dazzling adventure that will play out across centuries and continents, across history and art, as a young woman learns how far she will go to leave her mark on the world. But everything changes when, after nearly 300 years, Addie stumbles across a young man in a hidden bookstore, and he remembers her name. Kirkus writes, this is the kind of book you stay up all night reading, rich and satisfying and strange and impeccably crafted. Spanning centuries and continents, this is a darkly romantic and suspenseful tale by a writer at the top of her game. Next. Some of you may have read um, Marilyn Robinson's books um, in the past. She's written, this is actually kind of the fourth in a literary fiction series. It comes after Gilead, Holm, and Lila. So Jack tells the story of John Ames Boughton, the beloved, erratic, and grieved over prodigal son of a Presbyterian minister in Gilead, Iowa. In segregated St. Louis sometime after World War II, Jack falls in love with Della Miles, an African-American high school teacher who is also the daughter of a preacher, discerning, generous, and independent. Their fraught, beautiful romance is one of Robinson's greatest achievements. She doesn't write a lot of books. This is about the oh, fourth or fifth book in about 20 years, and they're fairly small, but they are just beautifully written. Next. The kids are going to ask. I think both Aaron and I read this as advanced reader copies. Um, this was kind of a fun book. Um, so a co-worker wrote, 17-year-old twins, Thomas and Savannah, lost their mother to a car accident several years ago. Their eccentric but loving grandmother, Maggie, is raising them. But Thomas in particular wonders about the birth father they've never met. The twins decide to search for him using a variety of sources, including their own podcast about it. Of course, Things get complicated quickly, and old family secrets and tensions threaten to tear the McLean's apart. This is a hilarious book, although I also cried more than once while reading. The story is told from several perspectives, and Anthony manages to give each a distinct voice. The twins definitely think and act like teenagers, which means sometimes they're extremely frustrated, but better than books where kids are more like small adults. I would love to know what happens next with their family. Thanks. The Killing Tide by Jean-Luc Benelet is the fifth novel in the internationally best-selling Commissaire Dupin series, and I think we have all the books now in the series here in the library. Deep sea fishers, dolphin researchers, smugglers, and an island shrouded in myth in the middle of the rough Atlantic Ocean. Commissaire Dupin had sworn he would never again investigate on the ocean, but his fifth case takes him ashore off the west coast of Brittany on a beautifully sunny day in June. He lands on the unique Leda Sen, populated by more rabbits than people, and which was formerly inhabited by powerful witches and even the devil himself. In front of this impressive backdrop between islands and the bay, Dupin and his team follow a puzzling case that pushes them to their very limits. If you like mystery set in a, in a different location like Donna Leon, which is set in Venice, or Louise Penny set in Quebec, um, I think you would enjoy these mysteries that are set in Britain and France. 
next. Leave the world behind. This was a really interesting book. <clears throat> so, Amanda and Clay head out to a remote corner of Long Island expecting a vacation. A quiet reprieve from life in New York City, quality time with their teenage son and daughter, and a taste of the good life in the luxurious home they've rented for the week. But a late night knock on the door breaks the spell. Ruth and G.H. are an older black couple. It's their house, and they've arrived in a panic. They bring the news that a sudden blackout has swept the city. But in this rural area, with the TV and internet now down, and no cell service, it's hard to know what to believe. Should Amanda and Clay trust this couple, and vice versa? What happened back in New York? Is the vacation home, isolated from civilization, a truly safe place for their family, and are they safe from one another? Library Journal wrote, Readers are given clues to events in the outside world, even as the characters remain unaware, but much is left unexplained, leaving the disquiet to linger long after the finish. Verdict, highly recommended and perfectly timed for today's uncertain world. And this very much was a kind of a, you can't say that it's a post-apocalyptic novel, um, because you aren't sure really if there is an apocalypse um, or what's going on. There is that kind of racial component, but it wasn't it wasn't overbearing in the book. Um, it was just very disquieting um, all the way to the end. And it, it's very true that you kind of it stays with you afterwards. Um, it, was, it was a very unusual, different book. Okay, next. One of my coworkers wrote about the lion's den. I read this all in one day, finishing well after you're going to be tired tomorrow o'clock in the morning. I kept thinking I knew where this story was going, but then we would take an abrupt starboard turn and I would be thrown off balance again. Thrillers aren't usually my first choice, but this was a lot of fun. This is a perfect summer read. Fast-paced, engrossing, dangerous, with exotic locations to take me away. Aspiring actress Belle accepts an invitation for a free week with her friend Summer on Summer's billionaire boyfriend's yacht in the south of France. Several other female friends and relatives tag along. Belle and Summer aren't as close as they were in high school, but surely Belle can make nice in exchange for sunbathing and decadence. But once they're all aboard, things begin to feel less relaxed. Summer's much older boyfriend is pretty controlling, not just with her, but with all the women. He collects their passports for safekeeping, has cameras everywhere, orders their meals, and won't tolerate lateness or insubordination. Belle becomes increasingly uneasy about this dream. Yes. Most of you probably know Isabel Allende, um, very prominent author, from, originally from Chile. From the author of The House of the Spirits, this epic novel spanning decades and crossing continents follows two young people as they flee the aftermath of the Spanish Civil War in search of a place to call home. A patron said about this book, I was moved by the determination of the war refugees to survive and regain a foothold, foothold on their own lives. The historical and geographic details provided a background of realism behind that hard horror story. And Publishers Weekly says, seamlessly juxtaposing exile with homecoming, otherness with belonging, and tyranny with freedom, the novel feels both timeless and perfectly timed for today. Thanks. Let's see here. Okay. Um, literary Reads describes me Mexican Gothic this way. A perfect Gothic mystery with an updated sensibility that will appeal to the modern reader. Noemi is a Mexico City socialite in the 1950s. When her father receives a disturbing letter from his niece, he sends Noemi to check on her cousin at the remote house where she is living. A grotesque and rotten English-style mansion built on dirt imported from England by the colonialist eugenicist family she's married into. Lush descriptions and a creepy atmosphere make this a good choice for readers who liked The Witch Elm by Thomas French, The Little Stranger by Sarah Waters, or The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson, or even Daphne de Maurier. Um, it has been listed as a horror book, but I would say at least the first three quarters of this is just strangely gothic. Um, it's, it reminded me very much of Daphne de, de Maurier in some respects. Um, and there's, there's horror only when you get to the very end. So 
if you like kind of suspense and, and gothic stuff, you I think you would enjoy next in the Next. Anthony Horowitz has turned out to be a very popular author um, around the world and, and here at the library. This is the um, second in the, the series, The Magpie Murders. Managing a small hotel on a Greek island, retired publisher Susan Ryland is getting restless when her new guests announced that her daughter Cicely was married in a Suffolk Coast hotel where a notorious murder took place on the same day as the wedding. Susan's late author, Alan Conway based a mystery on the murder, and Cicely, who read the book and is convinced that the wrong person was convicted of the real-life crime, is now missing. Obviously, Susan leaps to investigate. Horowitz brings back characters from the first in the series, The Magpie Murders. Publisher Weekly says, this is a flawless update of classic Golden Age whodunits. Next. Nothing More Dangerous is by Alan Eskins. For 15-year-old Bodhi, it begins when Lida Poe absconds with $168,000 and embezzled cash. No one knows where she has gone until Bodhi discovers her body with a bullet hole in, it, in her forehead. One mystery solved, but another looms. Who killed her? Meanwhile, an African-American family, the Elgins, moves in across the street. Mr. Elgin has been sent to manage the local plastics plant, dislodging the former manager, an incompetent good old boy. It being 1976, in a small Missouri Ozarks town, the shadow of Jim Crow still looms and the Elgins are less than welcome. Nevertheless, their son Thomas becomes Bodie's best friend. Other mysteries soon present themselves, some endangering Bodie and Thomas, who land in the thick of the various intrigues. Kirkus writes that this is perfect for readers who wish To Kill a Mockingbird had been presented from a slightly older male point of view. Next. The Once and Future Witches. This is by Alex Harrow, who um, wrote, I think, last year's, one of their best books last year was The 10,000 Doors of January. In 1893, there's no such thing as witches. There used to be in the wild, dark days before the burnings began, but now witching is nothing but tidy charms and nursery rhymes. If the modern woman wants any measure of power, she must find it at the ballot box. But when the Eastwood sisters, James Juniper, Agnes Amaranth and Beatrice Belladonna join the suffragists of New Salem. They begin to pursue the forgotten words and ways that might turn the women's movement into the witches' movement. Stalked by shadows and sickness, hunted by forces who will not suffer a witch to vote and perhaps not even to live, the sisters will need to delve into the oldest magics, draw new alliances, and heal the bond between them if they want to survive. Next. This was a very popular book. This was recommended by several readers here at the library. Um, and as I mentioned, this it's kind of similar in a little bit to the guest list by Lucy Foley, which I mentioned earlier. Getting snowed in at a beautiful rustic mountain chalet doesn't sound like the worst problem in the world, especially when there's a breathtaking vista, a cozy fire, and company to keep you warm. But what happens when that company is eight of your coworkers and you can't trust any of them? When our off-site company retreat meant to promote mindfulness and collaboration goes utterly wrong when an avalanche hits, the corporate food chain becomes irrelevant and survival trumps togetherness. Come Monday morning, how many members short will the team be? A patron wrote, Agatha Christie would have loved this thriller that takes place in a chalet where the business retreat ski vacation turns into a murderous getaway. An avalanche and power cut Power loss cuts this group off from the world as murders continue. It kept me on edge as I raced through it, trying to determine the killer's identity. Next. One of my coworkers wrote, a fun, fizzy book, chock full of pop cultural references and clever epistolary touches, from text messages and blogs to contract excerpts. B is an LA blogger who writes about plus size fashion and her love life when she gets the offer of a lifetime the chance to star on Main Squeeze, a reality gaming show. She's been hung up on a friend for years and decides this might be the fresh start she needs. But the realities of 25 suitors, some of whom have less than kind things to say to the plus size focus of the show, are not what we expect. And can she really trust that any of them are sincere in wanting to date her, let alone love and marry her? 
This was a lovely, honest, funny, and emotional book. B is unflinchingly straightforward about her struggles to find acceptance. The many romances kept me guessing for most of the book. B has several real possibilities, and it was hard to know who to root for because there was more than one good option. Next. The Only Good Indians follows four American Indian men after a disturbing event from their youth puts them in a desperate struggle for their lives. Trapped by an entity bent on revenge, these childhood friends are helpless as the culture and traditions they left behind catch up to them in a violent, vengeful way. Stephen Graham Jones generally writes novels in short story, short story collections in the horror genre, but also dabbles in crime fiction, fantasy, science fiction, and thrillers. While his genre of choice may vary, Jones's books tend to be a little bit unconventional, experimental, and creepy slash borderline disturbing, usually set in the American Southwest and frequently starring Native American characters. A co-worker wrote about the other Bennett sister. I've always felt some sympathy for Mary Bennett. Jane Austen plays the bookish middle sister, mostly for laughs and pride and prejudice, as she sings badly in public and makes awkward remarks. In The Other Bennett Sister, Janice Hadlow redeems Mary and gives her a rich inner life. The first part of the book parallels some of the plot of Pride and Prejudice, but most of it takes place two years later. The style and pacing of this book feel very Austinian, with third-person partial omniscient narration and relatively slow plot. There's a romance, but it's not really the point of the book. Mary is the star here as she takes her first tentative steps into the world and learns about herself. A very satisfying redemption for Miss Bennett. Next. Shaggy Bain was the um, Booker Prize winner for 2020. The unforgettable story of young Hugh Shuggy, or Shug, Shuggy Bain, a sweet and lonely boy who spends his 1980s childhood in rundown public housing in Glasgow, Scotland. Shuggy's mother, Agnes, walks a wayward path. She is his guiding light, but a burden for him and his siblings. She dreams of a house with its own front door while she flicks through the pages of the Freeman's catalog, ordering a little happiness on credit, anything to brighten up her great life. Agnes's older children find their own ways to get a distance from their mother, abandoning Chevy to care for her as she swings between alcoholic binges and sobriety. Chevy is meanwhile struggling to somehow become the normal boy he desperately longs to be, but everyone has realized that he has no right a boy with a secret that all but him can see. Agnes is supportive of her son, but her addiction has the power to eclipse everyone close to her, even her beloved children. Smoke Bitten is the latest, number 12, in the Mercy Thompson urban fantasy series set in the Tri-Cities of Washington. So it's always enjoyable to have a series that's set kind of in the Pacific Northwest, and who would think of the Tri-Cities as being the setting, setting for a, a, um, urban fantasy? So this is great. Centuries after the banishment of the Fae allows magical creatures to run wild, a violent escaped shapeshifter is pursued by a were coyote and her pack of protective half Um Some series read-alikes um, for the Mercy Thompson series would be Tanya Hoff's Blood series, um, or maybe Charlene Harris's Sophie Stackhouse series. Those. Next. In the summer of 1969, 14-year-old Lucas Painter carries a huge weight on his shoulders. His brother is fighting in Vietnam, his embattled parents are locked in a never-ending war, and his best friend Connor is struggling with his own family issues. To find relief from the chaos, Lucas takes long meandering walks, and one day he veers into the woods. There he discovers an isolated cabin and two huge dogs. Frightened, he runs, and the dogs run with him. Lucas finds unusual peace in running with the dogs, and eventually he meets their owner, Zoe Dinsmore. Closed off and haunted by a tragic past, Zoe has given up. She doesn't want to be saved. She wants out. But Lucas doesn't want her to go, and he sees an opportunity to bring more than one friend back into the light. It's either the best or worst idea he's ever had, but Lucas isn't giving up, on Zoe or Connor. Next. Um, it, I'm always intrigued when a book is not on my radar, is recommended by multiple readers. So it's like, you know, how did I miss that? I read this book and it was absolutely hilarious. In a peaceful retirement village, four unlikely friends meet weekly in the jigsaw room to discuss unsolved crimes. 
Together, they call themselves the Thursday Murder Club. Elizabeth, Joyce, Ibrahim, and Ron might be pushing 80, but they still have a few tricks up their sleeve. When a local developer is found dead with a mysterious photograph left next to the body, the Thursday Murder Club suddenly find themselves in the middle of their first live case. As the bodies begin to pile up, can our unorthodox but brilliant gang catch the killer before it's too late? This was just a fantastic book. Um, you get these little hints of some of these people's backgrounds. So Elizabeth is kind of the um, leader of this, this group in the retirement home. You kind of get the suspicion that she used to work for you know, MI6 or MI5 and as a spy in Eastern Europe. Um, you've got Ibrahim, who's a retired psychiatrist. Um, it's just really fun. Joyce, um, she's always baking cookies and making other things. And so when they have the police over to try and get information out of them, Joyce is usually offering them some kind of cake. Um, it is, this was a, one of the best books truly that I read this year. This was absolutely delightful. And yes, the BBC series is coming. And the, I, I was curious, I thought this book was so good. You know, is he going to write more about these characters? Sure enough, next fall, um, number two in this, which is now a series, is coming out. So look for Richard Osman on the Thursday Murder Club. Next. Ya Gayashi's stunning follow-up to her acclaimed national bestseller, Home, Com, Home, Home Going, is a powerful, raw, intimate, deeply layered novel about a Ghanaian family in Alabama. Um, I think Homegoing was, might have been a best book a couple of years ago. Gifty is a fifth year candidate in neuroscience at Stanford School of Medicine, studying reward seeking behavior in mice and the neural circuits of depression and addiction. Her brother was a gifted high school athlete who died of a heroin overdose after a knee injury left him hooked on Oxycontin. Her suicidal mother is living in her bed. Gifty is determined to discover the scientific basis for the suffering she sees all around her. But even as she turns to the hard sciences to unlock the mystery of her family's loss, she finds herself hungering for her childhood faith and grappling with the evangelical church in which she was raised, whose promise of salvation remains as tantalizing as it is for her Next. Um, this was on the National Book Awards long list of good fiction. Um, these twin sisters will always be identical, but after growing up together in a small southern black community and running away at age 16, it's not just the shape of their daily lives that is different as adults. It's everything. Their families, their communities, their racial identities. Many years later, one sister lives with her black daughter in the same southern town she once tried to escape. The other secretly passes for white, and her white husband knows nothing of her past. Still, even separated by so many miles and just as many lives, the fates of the twins remain intertwined. What will happen to the next generation when their own daughter's storylines intersect? Actually, if you enjoy Homecoming by the last author I mentioned, um, Ya Gayashi, you might enjoy The Vanishing Half and vice versa. Next. Um, this is an interesting parable, parable of gentrification. Um, and the comparisons I've seen to the film Get Out are apt. Cole takes an unflinching look at racism and class that's extremely relevant for our country today, but through a heart pounding and well crafted thriller. What one of my coworkers wrote. Sydney's Brooklyn Street is changing. Her black neighbors growing up were like family, but now they're being forced out as brownstones are being bought up by affluent white families, and a major pharmaceutical company is building a large drug treatment facility. Sydney starts a historical walking tour to tell the story of her neighborhood before it's too late. She's joined by Theo, her new and newly unemployed white neighbor. As the two do research for their tour, they notice a pattern of mysterious disappearances and property changing hands overnight. What's really going on? Is it just the neighborhood changing or is something more sinister afoot? What was really interesting about this book is Alyssa Cole um, typically writes romance. She's got a couple of romance series and this one, even though there was a romance element to it, it was really more of a thriller and another kind of a creeping realization that some kind of horror is going on. It was really, it was really interesting and quite different, I think, from her other books that she's, that she's written. Okay, next. Okay, Michael Robotham um, writes um, some 
Crime series. This is number two in the Cyrus Haven series. Criminal psychologist Cyrus Haven and Evie Cormack return in this new thriller. Who is Evie, the girl with no past running from? She was discovered hiding in a secret room in the aftermath of a terrible crime. Her ability to tell when someone is lying helped Cyrus crack an impenetrable case in Good Girl, Bad Girl. Now, the closer Cyrus gets to uncovering answers about Evie's dark history, the more he exposes Evie to danger, giving her no choice but to run. Ultimately, both will have to decide if some secrets are better left buried and some monsters should never be named. Um, some read-alike authors um, for this guy would be uh, maybe Peter Abrahams and Linwood Barclay. They write kind of similar um, crime and thriller type books. Okay, next. We're going to move on to nonfiction. Okay, so the first book in nonfiction is called The Address Book. Um, what street addresses reveal about identity, race, wealth, and power. This was a really interesting book. In this wide-ranging and remarkable book, Deidre Mask looks at the fate of streets named after Martin Luther King Jr., the wayfinding means of ancient Romans, and how Nazis haunt the streets of modern Germany. The flip side of having an address is not having one. And we also see what that means for millions of people today, including those who live in the slums of Kolkata and on the streets of London. And one of the things she brings up is how um, people say, um, for example, on the um, Rosebud, in Rosebud Indian Reservation in, in South Dakota, um, I think they can't register to vote because they don't actually have an address because their streets don't have any kind of addresses. So she brings up all of these issues. And it was very interesting. I had no idea what all this meant. So. Okay. Oh, and another thing. Let me, let me add one more thing. Um, in talking about um, Kolkata, previously named Col Calcutta, um, you can't get a business loan in, in India or Bangladesh or wherever this is. Um, unless you have an address. And so there are actually these um, groups that are going around and giving people addresses. And then there's the whole issue of like, you know, what do you name the street? Um, so people are getting addresses and they're getting street house numbers only because that's the only way they can let their bank account and then get a loan. So it, it was really an interesting book. So I highly recommend it. Okay, next. Okay, this was an extremely popular book this year. This was one of the most popular ones for nonfiction. Um, Isabel Wilkerson wrote um, The Warmth of Other Suns, which was a best book a few years ago. That had to do with the great migration of African Americans out of the American South, to, um, following, starting with World War I and, and years afterwards as they moved north to industry. In this brilliant book, Isabel Wilkerson gives us a masterful portrait of an unseen phenomenon in America as she explores through an immersive, deeply researched narrative and stories about real people, how America today and throughout its history has been shaped by a hidden caste system, a rigid hierarchy of human rankings. Beyond race, class, or other factors, there is a powerful caste system that influences people's lives and behavior and their nation's fate. Linking the caste systems of America, India, and Nazi Germany, Wilkerson explores eight pillars that underline caste systems across civilizations including divine will, bloodline, stigma, and more. Next. This was the National Book Award winner for nonfiction, The Dead Are Arising. This is a biography of Malcolm X. The result is this historic biography that conjures a never before seen world of its protagonist, a work whose title is inspired by a phrase Malcolm X used when he saw his Hartford followers stir with purpose as if the dead were truly rising to overcome the obstacles of racism. Next. This was an interesting book. It's a very thick book, it's very detailed. If you really want to read about all kinds of French chefs and, and French cooking, then I, I would recommend this book. Um, baffled by the language, but convinced that he can master the art of French cooking, or at least get to the bottom of why it's so revered, he begins what becomes a five-year odyssey by shadowing the esteemed French chef, Michel Richard in Washington, D.C. But when Buford quickly realizes that a stage in France is necessary, he goes, this time with his wife and three-year-old twin sons in tow, to Lyon, the gastronomic capital of France. Um, studying at a particular institute, which I won't try to pronounce, um, Cookie 
cooking at the storied Michelin starred restaurant, and during the endless hours and exacting rigor of the kitchen, Buford becomes a man obsessed. With proving himself on the line, proving that he is worthy of the gastronomic secrets he's learning, and proving that French cooking actually derives from, oh my God, the Italian. Um, Bill Buford, I didn't know this, I think he's the one who um, was one of the founding editors of um, Grantham magazine. And um, so he comes from this literary background, but he really got into to cooking big time. So, next. In this captivating adventure, Merlin Sheldrake explores the spectacular and neglected world of fungi, endlessly surprising organisms that sustain nearly all living systems. They can solve problems without a brain, stretching traditional definitions of intelligence, and can manipulate animal behavior with devastating precision. In giving us bread, alcohol, and life-saving medicines, fungi have shaped human history, and their psychedelic properties, which have influenced society since antiquity, have recently been shown to alleviate a number of mental illnesses. Okay. I like books about books, and that's what this one is. Pulitzer Prize-winning literary critic Machiko Kakutani shares 100 personal thought-provoking essays about books that have mattered to her and that help illuminate the world we live in today with beautiful illustrations throughout. Readers will discover novels and memoirs by some of the most gifted writers working today. Favorite classics worth reading or rereading, and nonfiction works, both old and new. These are essential works in American history, ranging from the Federalist Papers, the writings and speeches of Martin Luther King, books that address timely cultural dynamics, such as um, Elizabeth Fulbert's The Sixth Extinction, and Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, classics of children's literature, and novels by acclaimed contemporary authors. This was a fun book to read. I think anybody just about that reads will enjoy it. Thanks. Two centuries ago, nearly half the American North American diet was found in the wild. Today, so-called wild foods are becoming expensive commodities served to the wealthy in top restaurants. In Feasting Wild, geographer and anthropologist Gita Ray Lacerva traces our relationship to wild foods and shows what we sacrifice when we domesticate them, including biodiversity, indigenous knowledge, and an important connection to nature. Along the way, she samples wild foods herself, sipping elusive bird's nest soup in Borneo and smuggling Swedish moose meat home in her suitcase. Thoughtful, ambitious, and wide-ranging, Feasting Wild challenges to take a closer look at the way we eat today. Next. <laughs> Hidden Valley Road, I think this book is as important to um, history of medicine, history of mental health, as a book such as The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. This was a fascinating, fascinating book. Don and Mimi Galvin seem to be living the American dream. After World War II, Don's work with the Air Force brought them to Colorado, where their 12 children perfectly span the baby boom. The oldest born in 1945, the youngest in 1965. In those years, there was an established script for a family like the Galvins. Aspiration, hard work, upward mobility, domestic harmony, and they worked hard to play their parts. But behind the scenes was a different story. Psychological breakdown, sudden shocking violence, hidden abuse. By the mid-1970s, six of the 10 Galvin boys, one after another, were diagnosed with schizophrenia. How could this all happen to one family? It was a it was a fascinating book. It's interspersed with um, the history of schizophrenia in terms of what people thought caused it, whether it's nature or nurture, um, and and then it's just a, a an account of its family and how one by one their sons would become schizophrenic and become mentally ill, and down to um, you know, you'd have a son who did not become mentally ill, but his whole life was marked by waiting for it to happen. Um, it's just fascinating. The parents themselves were not abusive, um, except for possibly having 12 children that they probably really could not take care of. But, you know, if they'd had just four children, the first, of the first four, three of them had schizophrenia, and that would have overwhelmed anybody. And so to have 12, they had 10 boys, and then their last two were girls. And um, it's 
fascinating and shocking. It's a very quick read um, for, for a scientific book about this. So it was, it was really fascinating. I'd, I'd highly recommend it. Okay, next. A coworker wrote, if you've ever wondered what it would be like to be best friends with crazy ex-girlfriend co-creator Rachel Bloom, this short essay collection is your best chance. Bloom is unflinchingly honest about her childhood OCD issues, being the weird kid, toilet training as a four-year-old, and more. Even if you haven't seen Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, you'll enjoy Bloom's unique and irreverent takes. As a fan of her show, I was hoping for more anecdotes, but I enjoyed her musings on a variety of topics, including the amusement park she'd like to build for adults with drawings. Thanks. For at least 20,000 years, we have led not just an earthly existence, but a cosmic one. Celestial cycles drove every aspect of our daily lives. Our innate relationship with the stars shaped who we are, our art, religious beliefs, social status, scientific advances, and even our biology. But over the last few centuries, we have separated ourselves from the universe that surrounds us. Joe Marchant, spellbinding parade of the ways different cultures celebrated the majesty and mysteries in the night sky is a journey to the most awe-inspiring view you can ever see, looking up on a clear, dark, that experience and the thoughts it has engendered have radically shaped human civilization across millennia. The cosmos is the source of our greatest creativity in art and science and life. Next. This is the only cookbook on the list. This um, is by Ina Garten, who's the Barefoot Contessa, I think. Um, in this book, she shows 85 new recipes that will feed your deepest cravings. Many of these dishes are inspired by childhood favorites but with the volume turned way up, such as cheddar and chutney grilled cheese sandwiches, the perfect match for her creamy tomato bisque, smashed hamburgers with caramelized onions, and the crispiest hash browns that are actually made in a waffle iron. And I should not even be talking about this book since I haven't eaten lunch yet. Okay, next. This is Aaron's favorite book cover. Um, it has a great big spider on it. Um, Award-winning long-form journalist Eva Holland had always felt that her deepest fear was the death of a loved one. When her mother suddenly passes away, she's sent spiraling into an odyssey of confronting fear itself. Along with investigating the science of fear, Holland uses herself as a test subject, jumping out of airplanes, rock climbing, and delving into her fears of loss to better understand what her research on the science, medicine, and history of fear reveals. Along the way, Holland meets the scientists who are developing a pill to leech the fear and horror from traumatic memories and seeks out the sufferers of a rare disease that prevents them from ever feeling fear. Next. Have you ever wondered what those bright squiggly graffiti marks on the sidewalk mean or stop to consider why you don't see metal fire escapes on new buildings or ponder the story behind those dancing inflatable figures in car dealerships? 99% invisible is a Big Ideas podcast about small seeming things, revealing stories baked into the buildings we inhabit, the streets we drive, and the sidewalks we traverse. Mars and Kolstadt zoom in on the various elements that make our cities work, exploring the origins and other fascinating stories behind everything from power grids and fire escapes to drinking fountains and street signs. When he was just a fledgling bird watcher, Jonathan C. Slate had a chance encounter with one of the most mysterious birds on earth. Bigger than any owl he knew, it looked like a small bear with decorative feathers. He snapped a quick photo and shared it with experts. Soon he was on a five-year journey searching for this enormous, enigmatic creature in the lush, remote forests of eastern Russia. That first sighting set his calling as a scientist. This is a fascinating book, and Aaron, if you go to the next picture, we can see what one of these owls looks like. There it is. So this is the biggest owl in the world. Um, it's called Lakeston's fish owl. It has a wingspan of over six feet and it can weigh up to 10 pounds. And they're just, they're really cool. And the pictures in the book are great and you can find pictures online. They do look almost like kind of furry bears in a way. And they live in Siberia and Japan and um, very much Northeast um, Asia. This was a really interesting book. It actually got a lot of kudos this year. Um, you know, a lot of reviewers really, really liked Owls and Mr. Mice. Okay, next. 
The Splendid and the Vile. This is about Winston Churchill. In The Splendid and the Vile, Eric Larson shows how Churchill taught the British people the art of being fearless. It is a story of political brinkmanship, but it's also an intimate domestic drama set against the backdrop of Churchill's prime ministerial country home checkers, his wartime retreat, Ditchley, where he and his entourage go when the moon is brightest and the bombing threat is highest, and of course, number 10 Downing Street in London. I was on the whole list to get this book last spring at this time when the um, library shut down. I ended up having to buy it online from Powell's bookstore. That was the only way I could get this damn book for months. Um, it was really good. It was really good. If you like history um, and you're interested in, in learning about people and things such as around World War II, um, I think you'd like the splendid thing about it. Next. In the afternoon or early evening of June 25th, 1980, two young women were killed in an isolated clearing in rural Pocahontas County, West Virginia. They were hitchhiking to an outdoor peace festival known as the Rainbow Gathering, but never arrived. The killings have been called the Rainbow Murders. Part serial-like investigation, part Joan Didion-like meditation, the book follows the threads of this crime through the history of West Virginia, the Back to the Land movement, and the complex reality contemporary Appalachia forming a searing portrait of America and its divisions of gender and class and its violence. Next. The stark poignancy and political dispassion, Tightrope draws us deep into another America. The authors tell this story. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Water. The authors tell this story in part through the lives of some of the children with whom Kristoff grew up in rural Yamhill, Oregon. So here you have uh, Nicholas Kristoff from the New York Times. He grew up in Yamhill, an area that prospered for much of the 20th century, but has been devastated in the last few decades as blue collar jobs disappeared. About one quarter of the children on Kristoff's old school bus died in adulthood from drugs, alcohol, suicide, or reckless accidents. And while these particular stories unfolded in one corner of the country, they are representative of many places the authors write about, ranging from the Dakotas and Oklahoma to New York and Virginia. A patron wrote, the struggles of rural families, inequities in our country and how to address them, all set in rural Yamhill, Oregon. Kristoff is a lovely writer and researcher anyway. His Oregon roots shine clearly in this informative work. Next. Men like John Wayne and John Lennon, Nolan Ryan and Bruce Lee, Cesar Chavez, Christopher Reeve, and Miles Davis have touched the lives of millions. But at home, to their children, they were not their public persona. They were dead. Each of these 40 first-person narratives, intimate, heartfelt, unvarnished, surprising, and profoundly universal, shows us not only a very different view of a figure we thought we knew, but also a wholly fresh and moving idea of what it means to be a father. This was a really enjoyable group um, group of essays written by the children of these famous men. I highly recommend. Next, in May 1830, the United States formally launched a policy to expel Native Americans from the east of territories west of the Mississippi River. Justified as a humanitarian enterprise, the undertaking was to be systematic and rational, overseen by Washington's small but growing bureaucracy. But as the policy unfolded over the next decade, thousands of Native Americans died under the federal government's auspices, and thousands of others lost their possessions and homelands in an orgy of fraud, intimidation, and violence. Unworthy Republic reveals how expulsion became national policy and describes the chaotic and deadly results of the operation to deport 80,000 men, women, and children. Some of you may have read H's for Hawk by Helen McDonald. This is a book that came out this year. Um, one of my coworkers wrote, this is a book of essays by naturalist Helen McDonald. Her essays convey a wonder and respect and curiosity for the natural world, birds in particular. Her writing is descriptive and soothing. My favorite essay, having been to the top of the Empire State Building in recent years, is High Rise, where she writes of observing bird migrations from the top of that landmark one spring night. McDonald describes the night sky as a vast habitat full of life, even from the top of a skyscraper. And I have thought of stars as the only inhabitant of the night sky, inspiring and thought-provoking life. Next. 
one of our patrons, I think who's on this, on this um, thing, um, recommended this book, Why Fish Don't Exist by Lulu Miller. Um, this was a fascinating book. So David Starr Jordan was a taxonomist, a man possessed with bringing order to the natural world. In time, he would be credited with discovering nearly a fifth of the fish known to humans in his day. But the more of the hidden blueprint of life he uncovered, the harder the universe seemed to try to thwart him. His specimen collections were demolished by lightning, by fire, and eventually by the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, which sent more than a thousand of his discoveries housed in fragile glass jars plummeting to the floor. In an instant, his life's work was shattered. Jordan was the founding president of Stanford University. He was a racist advocate of eugenics, which is all brought out in this book. And he might have poisoned someone to cover up financial improprieties, including Leland Stanford's widow, Jane, who wanted to fire him as president of the university. Her death is still unexplained, um, but he was involved in a cover-up trying to claim that it was a heart attack um, when, in fact, the autopsy showed that she was poisoned. So, very interesting book. It's not a huge, um, long book, but, boy, you learn a lot reading Why Fish Don't Exist. It was a great book. Okay, last nonfiction book, World of Wonders. I'm not going to try to say the author's last name. A collection of essays about the natural world and the way it inhabits, its inhabitants can teach, support, and inspire us. As a child, she called many places home the grounds of a Kansas mental institution where her Filipina mother was a doctor, the open skies and tall mountains of Arizona, where she hiked with her Indian father, and the chillier climes of western New York and Ohio. But no matter where she was transplanted, no matter how awkward the fit or forbidding the landscape, she was able to turn to our world's fierce and funny creatures for guidance. A patron called it delightful, a perfect remedy for uncertain times. Thanks. So that is this year's best books. I hope it gave you some ideas of some things to, to read, both fiction and nonfiction. Um, I will mention again, this little thing has everything people suggested or recommended, um, including other books that critics recommended or were on best books lists that just didn't make it into the program. So um, yeah, pick up one of these at the curbside.